George Tuckwell. I'm Director of Geosciences and Engineering at RSK Group. And my talk is going to cover the use of near-surface geophysical tools in engineering site investigation contexts, specifically looking at where the information derived from geophysical surveys offsets the risk of unforeseen ground conditions for our clients. There are a great many tools available to us as geophysicists serving the engineering sector. Each one depends on different physical principles and is deployed with different survey parameters and methodologies. Part of our role in consultation with our clients is to choose the best geophysical tool for the particular situation. And this will depend on not just the geology and the nature of the engineering challenges, but also it'll depend on the attitude of risk of the client and the nature of the project that we're working on with them. So I want to look at the different sorts of data we can get from geophysical surveys and see how they relate to the risk of unforeseen ground conditions, really saying that information is the opposite of risk. So we can imagine in very simple terms that geophysical data could give us, for example, as in this data set, map view data across the site. In this case, this is time domain EM data across a brownfield site. And we can also get cross-sectional data this is electrical resistivity data on a site for the development of an onshore wind farm. Of course, we can also get 3D data sets. That's just an extension of these 2D cross-sectional data sets. But for now, let's just imagine these simple geometries. Another component of a ground investigation, sometimes the only component that is deployed, is intrusive site investigation techniques. These should always be used in conjunction with a geophysical site investigation. Geophysics should not be used in isolation. And we have a number of options here, boreholes, trial pits, window sampling, really anything which digs into the ground and allows you to take samples, uh, log the details of the material that is there. Now, one of the drawbacks of intrusive investigations is it gives you a great deal of information that's positive, but only about the bit that you've dug up. And there's a restriction in that, which we'll explore further in subsequent slides. So let's explore the offset between risk and information. Our conceptualization here is that risk is the opposite of information. So the risk when we come to a site on behalf of our clients is to understand what it is that we don't know that might be a risk to that client in the development that they're planning. So again, very simply here, we've color coded a possible risk in red. And the deeper colour of red indicates perhaps a higher level of risk. So in this example, we've got some risk in the shallow subsurface. It might be unknown buried services. It might be buried obstructions or concrete objects. We've got some risk at a greater depth, which might be an unknown water table. It could be variations in the bedrock, be it voids or erosion surfaces. And we've got an area of higher risk. Maybe that's come from desk study information which has told us that there are some chemicals stored there and there may be some higher risk of ground contamination. Let's then look at the information that offsets that. And so we have in the light blue here, our surface geophysics, for example, EM conductivity, magnetic mapping, or ground penetrating radar. And we've also got cross-sectional geophysics, uh, with, for example, resistivity, as we saw, or perhaps seismic refraction, or perhaps some deeper GPR data. And then in the deeper blue, indicating that we have a higher, richer amount of information, we have our intrusive investigations. So in this case, trial pits and boreholes. So we can imagine then, if we investigate a site with purely intrusive investigations, and this is far more detailed an investigation than you would ever do on a site of this size. So we've got six boreholes here, and 25 trial pits to try and characterize the ground. And what we've done then is turn the red, which was risk, into blue, which is information. So this now shaded in blue is where we do have information from our intrusive ground investigation. But critically, still shaded in red, this is where we don't have information from our ground investigation. This is effectively where the risk remains. So for us to tell a client that the site now is low risk, we need to be very confident that there's nothing happening in the geology between the locations we have borehole data. There's nothing happening in the near surface between the locations we have trial pits where there might be issues that would cause delays or costs to their project. 
So then let's see where geophysical site investigation comes into this and what it allows us to do, for example, in collecting map data, is to collect something about everything in the Earth's surface. It might be the electrical properties, uh, it might be the magnetic properties, but it gives us a tool to take a very quick look at the whole site. And this might indicate then to us that there are one or two near surface features which we may have missed by just digging holes. It could be that our trial pits uh, just missed the edge of a large concrete block. It could be our trial pits missed the location of an underground storage tank. But if we have that information from our geophysical data, we can target those anomalies. We can just look at them once with a targeted borehole or trial pit. And we can very clearly understand not only the layout, the geometry, the depth, the extent of features, but we can determine precisely what they are by looking at them in those trial pit or borehole logs. And we can also tie together our boreholes with our cross-sectional geophysical data, giving us confidence that there's nothing peculiar in, say, the water table or in the quality of the bedrock between one location and another. So the client can have peace of mind that the risks of unforeseen ground conditions have been minimised to the greatest extent possible. Let's just illustrate this point with one more example. This is an indoor washing line that my wife bought that she wanted to attach to the kitchen wall. Uh, here's a picture of the kitchen wall. And what she wanted to do was to find the woodwork behind the plasterboard to give a firm place to fix the washing line to. So she embarked on an intrusive investigation to locate the woodwork behind the plasterboard. Here then is where she started to drill. And then she continued looking for the woodwork behind the plasterboard. And still, after these many holes, she didn't find what she was looking for. So I did what I think anybody else would have done in the same circumstances. I brought home the high frequency ground penetrating radar equipment that I could apply to the wall, collect a 3D volume of data, as you see here up the wall. This is the location of the survey lines I used. And if you're familiar with ground penetrating radar data, that you'll see there's a, an anomaly reflection at this location indicative of a linear feature. We map that to its location on the wall, and this is where it sits. So the correct application of the right technology, rather than relying purely on intrusive information, allowed us to get the information we needed to de-risk the project and then complete it successfully albeit perhaps with a little bit more remediation than would otherwise have been necessary. So more seriously then, geophysics is a way of finding things across a site that might elude you if you just rely on intrusive investigations. What are the chances of finding a target, say with a regular grid of hole locations? If the target is relatively small, you need a very high number of holes, and you'll need to cover the whole site if what you're trying to prove is that that feature isn't present. If that feature represents something which would be visible to a geophysical instrument, then you can simply apply the geophysical technique across the site, identify the anomaly, and then just do one hole to confirm that that anomaly is relating to the feature that you are looking for. So in summary, when would you use geophysics? It's a very good search tool. You would use it to find something, either beneath the ground or concealed within a structure, that otherwise wouldn't be visible and wouldn't be easy to find by any other means. You can use it to provide reliable information across large areas, tying together the detailed information that you get from boreholes and trial pits. And you can use it to reduce and or target the intrusive investigations that you use. And it's this combination that allows you to reduce the risk of unforeseen ground conditions to the greatest effect. Let's have a look at some of the data sets that we've collected for our clients in recent years. This is a brownfield site. It's currently covered by crushed concrete, which is derived from the demolition of the industrial buildings which previously occupied the site. And what the client wanted to know is whether there are any structures still left in the ground associated with those previous buildings, which would hamper then the future development of the site. There should be nothing there, but is there? If there is, it's a risk to them. So we undertook 
uh, a frequency domain EM survey across the site. In this plot, the warmer colours are high conductivities and the cooler colours are low conductivities. And you can see in the south of the site an area of higher conductivity, which is associated actually with an increased fluid saturation in the ground. Uh, and that occurs immediately south of a linear feature, which looks very much like a metal pipe. So we have a metal pipe in the ground which is leaking fluids into the soil. Across a large proportion of the rest of the site, we have some very bright colours, and these are associated with concrete foundations and floor slabs, which are still present, which shouldn't be. So here we have the buried pipe. Here we have the foundation still present. This is crucial information to the client in understanding the value of the site before they take it forward for future development. Here's another example where we were looking for archaeology, actually, in this instance using magnetic data. And there are a number of archaeological features which we located within the data, but by far the largest signal, and this was unexpected for this site, came from two buried mine shafts which were present. They weren't expected, they were an unknown unknown for our client and for us, and so we were able to identify them and de-risk them therefore from the project for the client. And this is a really good example of where geophysics allows you to de-risk the site by taking a quick look at everything that's there. We were looking for archaeology, we found other features which were relevant to the client's development, and that wouldn't have happened if we were for just, for example, doing trenches for archaeological investigations. A great deal of the surveys that we do, typically for commercial projects, involve ground penetrating radar. And the most common target that we use this for are buried services and shallow buried obstructions. So here's some example of some ground penetrating radar data over a series of buried pipes. And the data we derive from this will be put into CAD drawings and fed to the client so that they can understand where each of the buried services are to connect to if they're developing the site or to avoid if they've got intrusive works planned uh, where buried cables, buried gas pipes would be a hazard. Another thing with ground penetrating radar is that it's a very good example of some of the recent advances in the collection of geophysical data in recent years. The physics of near surface geophysics hasn't changed, but our ability to collect large 3D data sets quite rapidly across the site has changed. And this gives us very rich data sets to collect things like not just buried services, but also the locations of ground conditions which are anomalous, for example, potential water leaks. Another common target for engineering studies are voids and poorly compacted ground. And the technique we would typically use in these situations is microgravity. Here's a microgravity map across an area of a proposed road scheme. And the blue colours are lows in that gravity map which represent an absence of mass in the subsurface immediately beneath those locations. Typically with a gravity map this would indicate an open void at depth, but in this particular case actually those open voids which were in the limestone beneath the sequence of glacial till, uh, that till has actually collapsed into the limestone and what we've got is not open voids but soft poorly compacted ground where that till has collapsed but not been compacted. Another common target is landfill sites and buried domestic waste. And this is a really nice example of another advantage of geophysics over intrusive investigations in that geophysics by its nature is non-intrusive. So we can investigate sensitive sites, for example, people's back gardens, uh, without making a mess, without digging holes, uh, without causing them excessive inconvenience. So this was one particular example where we were seeking to map the buried waste associated with an old landfill at this site to understand the depth of it, the nature of it, and where the edges of it were. And this is the data that we managed to collect with electrical resistivity across this site. And this allowed us to characterise where the waste was, uh, the location and nature of the clay cap across the site, uh, and also the leachate zone, where the fluids collected according to the, uh, generated by the decomposition of the waste have pulled and where they may be flowing out into the rest of the geology. 
Another common geophysical technique is seismic refraction, which we would use to map the thickness of soil over bedrock and to get the position of bedrock and layers within it and the condition of it, which would feed into the engineering parameters important for foundation design uh, and for infrastructure projects. The data derived from seismic refraction looks like this. On the left hand side, we have a tomographic picture of the seismic velocities through the ground beneath the seismic survey. And this can be correlated with borehole data to derive the picture on the right hand side, which is the layering that we've interpreted to be present from the arrival times of the different seismic waves in the seismic refraction survey. And it's important here that we can use the combination of boreholes and geophysics to give the client an indication of the accuracy and confidence with which we've picked the location of each one of those layers so that they can design with those risks included uh, the project, the foundations, the engineering that they need to do. So as a final point, if your site looks like this, where there's a high risk of features which are not visible at the surface and are going to be difficult to characterise and de-risk with a series of intrusive investigations, then you need to think whether a data set like this, with the information it will provide you, is going to be useful in de-risking that site and helping you understand how to take it forward for engineering development. Thank you for watching. If you like this presentation, please visit the EAG YouTube channel for more e-lectures.